Everybody should have a notebook in front of them. I am on tab one, and we're going into our open session um, from 9 to 11.15. Uh, and we're going to spend time on two subcommittee terrains, IT and the SES. And I think in both terrains, across the subcommittee meetings, we've made good progress in defining the topic areas where we feel like we can have the greatest impact. And that's the intersection of where there are corporate best practices that we believe can have an impact or are applicable to government operations. So I think we've made good, good progress in that funneling down to the to those uh, hot topic terrains. Um, in the SES terrain, many of you expressed an interest last meeting and across the subcommittees in getting to know the SES better, given how central they are to all of government operations. So we're going to spend time uh, bringing in some folks who have been SES members for many years, a couple who are very senior managers in the SES, and a few others um, who actually uh, have staff positions where they help to manage the SES across their agency. So we'll get both a line and staff perspective on the SES. Um, we will, uh, at 11.15 or so, break. Um, we're scheduled to meet with the president before he heads off to Walter Reed, and also with um, Secretary Geithner. And we'll have people out of here as promised by one. I have to make up for my performance last night. So maybe even the early side of one. I think that would be five minutes. Yes. <laughs> and to the five minute point, we'll also build in some breaks so everybody can do blackberries and uh, catch up. So with that, I'm sorry? In motor rolls. In motor rolls. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we now are uh, behind tab two. Um, he 
is a total star. He has a combination of the ability to think strategically and figure out the things that matter, and then get stuff done. I mean, oftentimes those two things don't correlate. Um, in Vivek, they're 100% correlated. Um, he has done unbelievable service across two and a half years. I can see all the dev sets yeah. and CIOs nodding their heads. Uh, and um, it, it, it is with sadness, but at the same time with a lot of admiration that uh, I say that he is leaving in two months. Um, very, very rarely do people give two months notice in government. Vivek has, and across the next two months, we're going to make sure we have a seamless transition and attempt to fill those very big shoes. So thank you for for all your service. And I know you'll end as strong as uh, the last two and a half years of And we're honoring you by forgetting to give you a name tag. Because you tell him what I mean. I can't get a name you want, and he took it as a souvenir. <laughs> Uh, so maybe I could ask uh, the rest of the agency officials just to quickly introduce themselves. Dan Conlon, the Secretary of Energy. Dan Harris, CIO of Education. Tony Miller, Education. Rebecca Blind, the Acting Deputy Secretary of Commerce. Uh, David Hayes, Deputy of Interior. Uh, Vernon Hayes, the CIO of Interior. Mike Lukai, the CIO of Energy. Great. I'm going to do one more slide before I turn it over to uh, all the IT experts here. So on page five, I just want to set things up by covering how the IT subcommittee selected its focus areas within this large terrain area of IT management. So you can see a box of criteria for selection at the top of the page. So we're looking to focus on issues that are, first of all, hard problems to solve in the government. Second of all, where there's a track record of effective best practices in the private sector. Third, where there is potential for meaningful impact. And then last, probably most importantly, we want to select issues where there is a reasonable degree of transferability between the private sector and the public sector. So for example, if the private sector's solution to a problem is, you know, let's give our IT program managers huge bonuses, well, probably, that's probably a non-starter. Uh -huh. Danny, not possible. <laughs> <laughs> if on the other hand, the private sector's solution has to do with a new project management methodology, then maybe we can work so, so that's what we've tried to zero in these types of criteria. Um, so a little bit of background on how we gathered information. We wanted to get a government perspective, so we worked closely with Rebecca and his team. We met with a number of the agency CIOs uh, around this table and others. And then we also wanted to get a sense of how the private sector addresses these issues. So we interviewed each of the member companies on the IT subcommittee, talked to their CIOs. Um, I think one thing that we really tried to do was um, instead of, it's tempting to try to cover the whole landscape, but if you go a mile wide and an inch deep, you're probably not going to make as much of an impact. So we've really driven to a couple of fairly specific topic areas here. And you can see them at the bottom of the page, what emerged. Um, first is, how do we make sure that IT and their business partners are aligned around the business's needs? And then second, how do you manage the performance of your IT vendors? Effectively. So we're going to dive into both these. I'm going to turn it over to Vivek. Actually, let me just pull up here just since we're kind of sharing this with the whole board first. Are there any kind of questions? Do those sound right? We're going to get into them deeper, but what was the further? Great. Great. All right, great. So on slide six, what was really enlightening for us um, was the, the value that the private sector brought uh, to thinking about some of these uh, persistent problems that the federal government has struggled with. So the government has actually struggled a lot with um, coordinating IT projects from the planning phase all the way down to the execution phase. Uh, three big things, as we've seen, um, challenges the government faces is number one is around uh, limited control of CIOs uh, when it comes to the budget, um, and also in terms of uh, making sure that uh, the business is actively engaged. Two is that there have been unclear project benefits from the very beginning, which makes prioritizing uh, first order, second order, third order, what do you go after, very, very difficult across the federal government. Three, there are regulatory and legal frameworks that can constantly keep changing, so the uncertainty there. And of course, with leadership too, uh, is one of the big challenges um, within the federal government. But what's interesting here is that the private sector actually does this very differently. So first, with uh, integrating the strategic planning right up front with the IT planning. So it's not an afterthought, but it's hardwired from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Second, 
is that the, there's a very rigorous methodology on how you compare projects so you can differentiate value. So you can make a decision around where you spend the majority of your energy. And the third, the senior level IT advisory boards were actually real advisory boards that would make decisions with very active engagement uh, on the business side rather than just the technology side. So there's a lot to learn here. What I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to Shantanu to talk about uh, how they actually do it at Adobe and uh, Liz in terms of how they actually do it at uh, OSI. Great. Thanks, for that. Uh, first, maybe before I even start, I, just to set a bit, which is from a big picture perspective, there's no question at Adobe that we view IT as a big enabler uh, to accomplishing our business goals. And it might sound obvious, but I think unless you state that in terms of you know how we get closer to our customers, how we drive revenue, how we drive better customer service, I think you have to get to that understanding that IT is a big part of strategically where you want to go. Uh, and the second big picture I would say is that we recognize that this is not a sprint, but you know it's really a long-term marathon in terms of how you're trying to drive the company forward. And so, you know, with, with that sort of in mind, uh, the first thing we do strategically is we sort of say, how do we even divide up the money that we have between new projects, existing projects, and maintenance and uh, depreciation, so to speak, because. Unless you're clear about trying to drive change and trying to drive new, uh, you know, I like to call it, you have infinite projects. Every existing project can take up all your available resources. So you have to actually, I think, proactively drive towards what kind of mix you want to see between keeping your current systems running, uh, keeping the lights on, versus how you want to invest in new businesses or new IT projects that are going to drive new business uh, you know, benefits for you. And also strategically, in addition to having that mix of how we want to spend money, we think about architectural consistency because I think there's a little bit of a, uh, potential uh, easy win about you know building things that may not serve you well long-term architecturally. So just to set those uh, things in context, which is you have to think about long-term architectural consistency, otherwise you have a mismatch of projects that actually don't work together. So you know, our goals, as you can sort of see a little bit on the slide, is you know, for all the projects, we clearly want to deliver projects that support the business strategies and realize uh, measurable value. But equally important, we want to hold not just IT, but the business leaders accountable for both the adoption as well as the realization of the value once this technology is delivered. Uh, you know, it's very simple to say from a sales point of view, for example, I need this new Salesforce automation, or I need this new system, and I'm going to drive revenue. But unless they quantify it and it becomes part of their next year goals, you know, you're really not holding them accountable. So I, I think we've tried to really uh, formalize how we hold these business leaders accountable for adoption. And there are three parts to that. Uh, the first part is you know the partnership between IT and the business leaders, which is how are you making sure that you uh, become a trusted partner, both between IT and business. And all the project investments that we make annually, they have to cascade back to our strategic goals and our annual objectives. And so you know, if, whether you're in IT or whether you're on the business side, you know exactly how you know, the projects that you're allocating against tie back to the annual strategic objectives, as well as the KPIs that you have for yourself as an organization. And I, I think Vivek mentioned this, I know Liz has this as well. We definitely have a cross-functional governance council which helps you know, uh, in those decisions because there's always trade-offs that are involved. So step one I would say to the execution is the partnership. The second one is the shared responsibility. And we've come up with a value model. And what the value model really, it's all about having skin in the game. And so the value model basically says for every project, are you trying to grow revenue? Are you trying to reduce costs? Or are you trying to you know, increase productivity and efficiency? And that has to show up then in the plan for next year. You know, if you're saving costs, well, next year, you know, when you start the budgeting process, there's that negative uh, you know, amount associated with the budget. So unless you have this long-term accountability, we found that people invest in IT projects, but there's no uh, accountability that we have. And the third thing I would say is that you know transparency was a big part to really making this a shared responsibility. So we have a real-time dashboard for all of our PIT projects 
Uh, you know, we're constantly monitoring that. We have an out of bounds, very formal process in case something else happens which uh, moves that project out of bounds. And you know, they are again all tied back. So it's called the blue dock in our particular case, but it ties back to strategic uh, objectives as to share. So I would say those are the three parts of you know how we run. And on the next page, just very quickly, is a, a sample example of that. This one, you know, we haven't put the numbers in there, but it really deals with virtualization. I think every one of us in IT probably has tens of thousands of servers lying around with all these old archaic systems. And we really clearly wanted to make sure that over many years we virtualized all of that, which I think is a common theme that all of you probably face. And uh, you know, there's an investment that you have to make upfront uh, to get the benefits long term. So as you can see, you know, we model out what those benefits look like. But there's one of these value models that actually exists for every major project that we have. So that's sort of a quick summary of how we do. Great. Well, I can certainly um, echo much of uh, what Shantanu does. And so I'm all going to focus on what's different about it, which is I think what he articulated most of the leaders around the table would say are absolutely the hallmark of a healthy IT governance program. So at OSI, you know, uh, prior to 2009, um, this should resonate from having spoken with many of you. We were really very independent five restaurants with what I would describe you know, optimistically as a patchwork quilt of IT infrastructure. And uh, the first thing to Shantanu's point that we really had to develop was the notion of fewer, bigger, better. And it's become somewhat of a mantra in our organization. Um, we cut the IT projects immediately by 50% while increasing IT spending over 3x. And there was just a ton of uh, as Shantanu said, loose ends, legacy projects, things that had been greenlighted that nobody kind of knew why they were still going along if they had this momentum of their own. And so the first thing was to kind of get control of the resources and bring it into a manageable situation. Very similar uh, to the approach that uh, Shantanu outlined, we have a governance structure that starts with the business long range plans and five key company objectives. This is kind of a big believer that you can maybe do three and five as a stretch. And then the IT goals have to align. So the screen is, this is what we have to do. How does this project that's being proposed support that or not support that? Very similar. The entire company is aligned on this business plan and IT plan. And as Shantanu said, it's not just an IT plan. It's a joint ownership plan to deliver the business objectives and there's joint ownership. We have a governance committee, very similar, called the ITAC, and it is chaired by the CIO, but for uh, purposes of our organization, the entire uh, executive leadership team is around the table, and I participate actively. Uh, and these are robust, I love the uh, thing of it's a marathon, uh, not a sprint, because it is. This is an innovative process that you have to go through to establish annual priorities, look at multi-year projects. We meet quarterly, and we prioritize projects and project resources, we monitor via dashboards. And I think this one's really important because we all have a, an optimism and a desire to use technology. We've had to implement a really strict one-in, one-out policy. Because what what high performing groups tend to do is they tend to keep adding projects, but nothing ever comes off the table. And what I found in IT is that we will greenlight a project, and it's the iceberg analogy. You've only identified the top, but what it takes to get done, the 90% of the resources on the business side and the IT side that are needed to come together, nobody's thought through when they put that plane in the air. So we pretty much focus pretty strongly on that. Um, we also don't allow a project to get in the air until there is a full list of the organizational resources on the business side and the IT side that are going to work on this and what percentage of this time. Because what you find as you go back is that you have the same person allocated 800% of their time. So businesses, projects never get done. You know, Bob has got 700% of his time allocated across seven projects. So we really, really measure that down. We won't let a project going to go into the air until there's a full business slate that clearly says that this person's going to be able to spend that time on it. And then, you know, we have only the top executive team and the top advisory council um, can prioritize, cancel, delay, or rescope 
the IT function. You can't have them lower down any organization. My experience is you have tons of scope creep all over the place. Um, and then finally, um, you know, both business and IT leaders and team members have their project and key milestones on their annual performance objectives. So it's not about money and bonus and dollars, but it's literally about did you partner to make this happen according to the milestones? And my experience is, and I, you know, I think probably it's shared, when IT projects are delayed, which they almost always are, it tends to be that the business resources were not available, not the IT resources. So it's really important that the business contact that's going to make it happen, that you've identified all of that. In my experience, that is always why it's like, um, the next page just reinforces what Shantou said, and you know, if it's all good because by definition it, it is an iterative process, but it's kind of this point of there's no shortcuts. You know, once we have a project team and a project that's been put in the air, laying in the air, then it's an iterative project where the, the eye tag of that project meets, incorporates business needs, goes to the next has an output so that you kind of have three or four iterative sessions before you finally finish. So that means that by the end of the finished product, expectations have been fully aligned. And that you don't have the kind of situation where um, the business gets delivered something that they didn't realize that this is what it was going to do. It speeds up project execution by focusing on development and minimizing documentation. You know, we, we try to keep, as I said here, you know, just enough ceremony to produce frequent and high quality solutions, but we tend to make these working sessions. And it just results in much less free work. So, so Danny, um, you know, what I thought was really interesting here, Danny is the CIO at the Department of Education, is um, what uh, Shantri, you, and uh, is what you talked about in terms of being able to put in place systems that um, allow you to see whether it's out of bound projects and how to build the right structures there, or to figure out that it, up front that there's no difference between sort of the business plan and the IT plan. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the Department of Education and uh, sort of how you look at that universe in the federated environment? Sure. What we do is we've uh, we use a segment approach. Uh, we've probably been at it for the last three years. It was probably the most significant impact that we had on IT spend in the department's history. And so a segment is a line of business, it's a broad line of business. But until we actually looked at spending from a segment perspective, we had duplicate projects, duplicate spending. And so now, if you are, let's say, uh, you want to spend the IT dollars on grants management or the grants management line of business, you have to actually go to the grants management segment owner and you have to sell that concept. And that segment owner has to answer a number of questions. One, do we already have an investment that either solves that business problem or with a slight modification can support that business problem? And what is the value? What is the value of that specific solution? And does it map to our enterprise architecture? So there's a list. There's about a dozen questions that, uh, that business owner would have to sell and convince the segment owner of before that actually becomes an investment. Over a very short period of time, we significantly reduce the amount of spend. And at the high level spend, the major investment, there's no, no communication. Obviously, at the minor spend, you know, less than a million dollars, less than five hundred thousand dollars, you're still going to see some duplication. But at the major spend level, no duplication because it just simply doesn't get through the process. It will be interesting, Gordy, from your perspective too, as a CIO at the Department of Interior, this is how we can replicate some of these best practices. So the challenge is, for example, in Bernie's organization, right, uh, where the secretary can even send an email, uh, as uh, Deputy, Deputy Secretary Hayes mentioned last time, because the infrastructure was just so fragmented. We'd love to get your thoughts on uh, how Interior, as it's going for a transformation right now, and fundamentally rethinking its governance. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what you've done so far, uh, Bernie, and then where there are some issues that uh, we can get some uh, thinking around? Right, I'm, I'm so grateful to be at this, uh, this uh, presence here. Uh, listening to both of you, uh, one of the things you brought up was about uh, 
the taxing of individuals um, on these multiple projects. We have an expression internally, I call it STP, but it's the same 12 people, which is the uh, <laughs> ones that, that we always go to to come to try to have the execution. What we're doing with the Department of Interior is we are, uh, we have a multi-fold process. One is a consolidation of what we consider a common commodity type of utilities. That's our infrastructure. We have aging infrastructure without at not really good total cost of operations models to recycle the refreshing of those technologies. And we're also focused on what we call the governance and what Danny was talking about, about lines of business or segments. The Department of Interior, we have, I think, one of the most, if we talk in architecture, the most diverse business lines. We have 30 separate, 37 separate business lines. And what we are doing in the Department of Interior is creating what I call uh, domain areas, things like law enforcement, things like energy, and we are appointing, uh, we are, we're not only federated, we're distributed organization. Uh, that is appointing people from within the department of the OF, from the Office of the Secretary, as well as uh, owners from these different domain areas. And so we're going through a governance process of streamlining all that, whereas in the past we have literally dozens and dozens of individual investment review boards and everyone was a passing student and all that. What we're doing now is applying a rigorous approach to saying these are common applications, this is the common area, everyone shares those, and bringing experts with the CIO supporting the experts to say, is this merit consideration to continue funding or not? The, the question on that table is like, you know, the various um, uh, departments is sort of the scale. So when I think of the Department of Commerce, for example, uh, with Simone, the CIO, who's here, has got to sort of missed and know on all these different agencies. What's your advice as we think about you know, this, where you have CIOs at departmental level that may not necessarily manage the entire budget, but at the same time, you've got uh, sort of these teethless uh, review boards across the federal government uh, that, that aren't really able to uh, drive change as aggressively, how should we begin to even tackle that problem? I could, so, I, I, I was, you know, I think the whole committee, Enrique, um, Ron isn't here, but he did something. Um, the first thing, you know, that is that um, it has to have the involvement at, of a senior level of the house, and, uh, you know, I know you have a council that meets, you know, but it's that people. You can't leave it because those I tax that exist down in front of the organization, they are toothless and they will not be able to. So you have to agree on a set of principles at the top, and no one can change those without bringing them back, right? So all the, you know, it, it, that's kind of what we do. The one question I, I had though um, for you, Danny, in talking through this is. You tend to get into A, B, and C priorities with, with um, IT. And what we found was that the C priorities, what you, you just let happen and people have decision rights over, they suck in a, a huge amount of resources on the business side and on the IT side. So the first thing we had to do was bring all that in and in, in effect put a freeze on those and just say, we're out of business on these things. I know that for your project, it seems absolutely critical to build that interface, but we're freezing all of that work because we literally need to take the business resources and we need to take the IT resources and bring them up to the A projects. One, to ban the planes, and two, to better control them. So I guess I would first say it's a tough step to take in an organization, but I've never been able to make progress without first putting a freeze on the 2000 C priorities that are critical to one person and one team so that it frees up and it returns control of the top so that you can get the key programs done. So I agree. I mean, two things. First is you've got to cancel some projects as well. If, if you don't cancel any project, you know, I, then I, I don't think the ITAC or the governance council or whatever your group is really has any uh, real authority. And so you have to figure out which ones have outlived their uh, you know, value. Can I just pause for a second with a little data on the table? Um, Bowen B, went back working with agency leadership, did 50 of these tech stack sessions, which would go deep on 50 large projects. And a bunch of cancellations came out of that. That's great. Then we transferred the technology, as it should be done, to the agencies, 
which is fabulous, and, and, and those text ad sessions are now happening. However, cancellations aren't happening anymore. So the, I mean, there's good things happening. Projects are being streamlined, you know, unnecessary bells and whistles are going away, but it's interesting when the heavy, the vet here, no longer was there, the agencies tended to make good progress. Again, it's a good thing, but the, the terminations have stopped. Well, I imagine, as you would say, it requires constant vigilance because it's, it's like it's weeds. Like they keep, they grow up, they keep yes. coming back if you don't constantly. We, it, there's no substitution for senior leadership involvement. There isn't, I mean, I've tried to delegate this thing 50 times, and this is what happens. And so I just, I spent 25% of my time on these matters and I bet most of us could because you're exactly right. There's good intention, but it doesn't happen unless you're at the table saying one in, one out. Nope, we're gonna kill that. We're green lining it, it, That's a very good that's it's, it's in government it's called pay go. Meaning pay go. Meaning that if you're gonna do something new you gotta figure out what to pay for it in our right. budget. Right. That's what you in essence have is we're not starting anything new without something being done or killed. Right. Because everybody's fully resourced. I mean, just to, to add to what Jeff said in terms of data points, right? So what, when we did it sort of from the White House perspective with agencies, we were able to uh, save about $3 billion. Um, as we tried to federate, we solve the scaling problem, as Jeff um, outlined, uh, because we realized that if every CIO in the department replicate the same uh, model, what we would be able to do is go after far more projects and determinations, but the challenge was after 75 projects versus 50, there are only $11 million in savings. So, so that's the big challenge that we're trying to figure out, both government-wide, but also at a departmental level, right? So Simone, for example, when you review a project at NIST or NOAA, right, what are some of the challenges? If you give us a flavor of that, maybe we can try to problem solve. I'd be happy to talk about that, but I, I do want to mention that it almost sounds like we are talking about two different things because the tech staff process was focused on poorly performing or high risk types of projects. And, and what I thought I heard from Liz was also just looking at those C priorities. It's a matter of reprioritizing, sort of getting rid of the old to make way for the new. And that, that inherently won't happen through the tech staff process. If the tech staff process is focused on high risk or poor performance. And so it sounds like there might be some complementary process here where even if things are performing perfectly well, maybe they've outlived their utility, or maybe they're still useful, but just not as important as some of the new things that we want to be able to do. And it sounds like there's just an inherently different type of process that might also be needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, I'd be interested in the process is every project. It's not just we're performing ones because it's literally a pool of dollars and full of resources and everything has to be evaluated because business needs change. So nothing's secure until you exit the quarterly meeting and it's going to be, you know, okay. we so we should bring the debt. Okay, what is yours? Sorry. Good um, one last thing that, that I'll add though is I think it does link back to um, to the question that, that we back posed outward regarding this issue of, of distributing or federating organizations without that much control because I can look across the department and perhaps identify some programs or projects that are by you the low priority, but I don't control the vast majority of them. And so it, it, it's not, I don't have the, the, the business span of control to say, well, that project in this organization is not as important as this new thing they want to do in this other organization. And so we should free up the resources to, to reinvest elsewhere. It's very much, there's a lot of global autonomy and, and local control over what, what fund gets spent on. Let me just give you a comment. One of the things that I worry about in our organization is we seem to have a lot of churn projects. It feels like we start lots of things and things get reprioritized. I think at some point on the, the governance process that you're hearing from Johnson and Liz is you really got to be rigorous on what you pick. But once you pick, you gotta make commitments and they gotta be funded to completion. And projects are not going well, then that comes back to project management. But I worry about IT project churn because if you don't have the resources allocated and it's like your STP convert, but that creates so much churn and efficiency. You gotta make commitments and you gotta go for it and you gotta get it done. Now, you asked a question I was wrestling a little bit with that, which was, why do we have committees that have no power? And the question you want to ask yourself is, 
if that committee went away, what would not happen? So if you go to each, each of these different committee groups that you've got, what isn't happening if they go away? And answer that question and you make some progress. But I do worry about project I want to make being clear on, on as we do a subcommittee, if other board members should feel free who aren't in that subcommittee to so, so just ask I'm not, I'm not, please, that point, please. I'm not involved in the IT thing, but to bridge on the case point, um, it's easier said than done because it's this, this massive thing. But so maybe you start, you just discontinue a lot of what appear to be formalized legacy processes that come with that. And I wrote down four things sound the siren. Use the power of the office. Get the right people. Control the camera. The, the calendar. Sound the so siren. Four, sound the siren. Use the power of the office. Get the right people. Control the calendar. The thought being, forget about the fragmentation, lack of, lack of control, inefficiency, the realities of all the imperfections of why it's so hard to things. First things first. Sound the siren. Formally, it says there's going to be a cradle to grave review of IT um, systems and implementation and processes using the power of the office, the vet, the office, the president, whatever it is. So there's this clarion call, regardless of whatever department you're in, hey, I heard this, this top to bottom review. Sound the siren, use the power of the office. Forget the formal or structured committees and have a prioritization, ad hoc, informal, up-to-date, new, and have people, regardless of what level in the organization, on a call. And it, and sometimes we kind of look to over-intensively process things or systematize. Or let's buy software to look at a dashboard with green and red. Jump on a call weekly or bi-weekly. It could be 10, it could be 15, it could be 30 people. Have it very efficient, driven by one person, and you go around and say, Kinder, what are your top five? Science, what's your top five? Even, even if it's sloppy, even if it's you're not prepared, the fact that there's a clarion call and there's an operational control the calendar review process. So I may know what I'm doing or I may not, Liz may or may not, but she knows and I know there's a call on Monday. So there's a level of preparation. And that may, even if it's informal, force the alignment within the age. So if a CIO doesn't have control of the whole um, agency or group and it's fragmented, he or she is forced to get alignment with their business or agency leaders. And the reason there's awareness of that is because you sound the siren. So it's a little bit of a, it isn't business as usual. We're not going to incrementally cut 11 million. We're not going to put one out. There, there's, a, there's more urgency. There's a, there's a significant level of urgency to drive efficiency and get government more upgraded from a technology standpoint. It's just a, it's an informal thing and it sounds good, I'm sure it's very hard to do, but that's what I was thinking about. That, that sounds like common sense, Mike, how do we implement this? You know, it's really interesting. Um, I, I came in recently, recently in the federal government from the state government and the private sector, and immediately when I came in, Deputy Secretary Conman, who's sitting right here, sounded the siren and said, we will do a deep review of all of the IT systems within the Department of Energy, not in 90 days, but within 45 days. And then he formed a very much like your ITAC was. We formed the Information Man Management Governance Council with undersecretary representation, so that we could get our arms around this from the highest from the highest level. And actually, we've been solving some problems. We had a, uh, a cyber incident recently. We used the IMGC uh, to bring together all the resources and actually uh, consolidate our fragmented incident uh, coordination incident and capabilities and got that consensus across all lines of business and moved it very, very quickly. So these private sector capabilities, which I believe this was patterned after, uh, really can work if it's if, if you're empowered from the top of the department and from the top of the U.S. government. Let me do this, uh, actually, okay. Uh, a lot of this is counsel to Dan, Tony, and David. Uh, so one of the, uh, uh, we need to probably in the next four or five minutes switch to the other topic, but I'd love to have the three of you give a sense of how what you're hearing today could help you, which will help inform our work. Um, for me, uh, uh, Mike, you said, the key thing, the resonance here 
is we insist that our other sector which are our division, which is the energy, science, and national security, they have to own this through this governance council, but the CAO is really the one who's got all of them that I you know, intellectually probably to, to, to realize that. The challenge I'm struggling with, I, I love the one in, one out metaphor, I'm going to take that back, but it's the ephemeral nature of what we do. You know, we're presidential appointees, we're not in that long, right? We have budget cycles mandated by Congress so we can hurt the jerky. So what I'm my my takeaway I've got to figure out here, and I, I think I got a window for it, is how to take these processes and get them so that they're woven into the fabric of the career people so that the delivery back to them will be sufficiently attractive that they'll stick with it when we're gone. And I think that I think that's gonna be the challenge in the last meeting second going to come We have done a lot of work mainly because of the recovery act and getting much deeper transparency. We used to have contractors reporting and everybody uploading data to the next level to the next level, each time producing two forms of distortion, intentional and unintentional. We have gone to a much flatter, transparent structure. So you can look down from the seventh floor down to the deck plates and see right through. That's very empowering to the career of you. And I think that's how we're going to try to get our, our arms around this problem of having a marathon a bunch of sprinters handing the towel out to the next Yeah. yeah. For, for us, I think part of the challenge is top down goal setting and linking to your business. Because I think the environment, I think one of the challenges that we have, anyways, we're top, we're starting with the level of uh, IT enablement that is, I would say, on average, well below what you see in the private today. So we're doing timesheets by hand, right? I mean, you're, you're talking about, wow, there's a whole lot of things that just, Say, well, that's crazy. Why are we doing that? Because there's kind of this feeling that you can have a lot more productivity and process improvement if you had more IT tools to pull. But still, the vast majority of your IT spend is spent on kind of your larger sister maintenance, right? And so the big thing is how do we keep even this you know, not 21st century necessarily business process, you know, IT infrastructure, going, and at the same time, in a more strategic way, really try to bring a whole new level of productivity. And that's what I think one of the challenges. How do we actually set goals for how much of this spend should be allocated in what buckets? How do you then get your political leadership and your career leadership to really embrace that? Because as you said, the real issue of business leadership and the change management required, not the IT. And that's what I think has been some of our bottom. And so in the interim, you're kind of managing projects against the segment lines of business, but probably our biggest management challenge is really bringing a vision for what you're really trying to accomplish top three priorities and how are we going to start shifting spin and then we can drive our IT agenda to that. And I think we struggle with that still right now. We're, we're getting much, much better on the IT execution once that's defined, where we struggle which is really setting kind of what we think is going to be an optimal agenda. Dave? Uh, just a couple of quick points. This is a terrific discussion and very helpful to all of us. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, I want to say Greg's comment really resonated with me. You know, there, it, it is easy, and I imagine for even you guys, but certainly for us who are sitting on top of large, federated, distributed organizations to feel like we really don't have as much power as we do. If you call a meeting, Bruce Babbitt taught, taught me this in the 90s when I was in the department before, if you're interested in an issue, just call a meeting and start and having regular meetings. And we are, we are doing that, and people do realize, okay, you're involved. In our case, Secretary Salazar is very interested in this issue, wants to hear about it routinely, calls meetings, and, and uh, so that's very helpful to get reinforced also that we don't have to you know, have be totally prepared and have long issue papers uh, in anticipation of the meeting. Um, I would say uh, the other thing, uh, two other things I'm taking out of this. One is we have a huge challenge in aligning IT with our business needs. And, and Liz, your, your comments were very helpful in that regard. And, 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 and there's been a sense that the IT world is, is its own little world. And, you know, and, and, and we've had lots of fiefdoms and the IT folks, you know, they're, they're all their own technology experts. And Bernie's done a great job in terms of leadership of changing that. Our, our IT folks now down through the organizations are really strategic enablers. They are not the decision makers on what hardware to use, what software to use. We've changed all the descriptions all the way down 
we, we're trying to make it a much more central thing. But it's not just a centralization, it's really a shift in thinking about what the IT function is. It is, it is not the, 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 all the way through the place where these big decisions are made. It is, it is an enabling part of the business operation. That's a huge transformation that we're trying to, to implement. The, the final thing I'll say is, and this goes to something that uh, um, uh, Jeff and Vivek talked about, I, I, and the question, why is it that now that these reviews are back in the department, we're not finding these huge high-risk projects? Um, I think that I think that maybe it's not unhealthy. Uh, I think we are still, uh, and, and, and Liz, your point about, about a lot of what we, yes, yes, we can get the big hit and kill those big, ugly projects. And frankly, Vivek has done that very effectively. Uh, he's always Perfect. welcome in our department. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but just as important is, in particularly in a time of shrinking budgets, uh, is, is that second function of prioritizing among what, what you know you have to support. And actually, I think our budget uh, constraints are, help, are helping us in that regard. Everyone gets it in the federal government. There's not going to be enough money. It's an opportunity for us, really, uh, to, to, to make some of those decisions that in the past just got to keep down the road. Yeah, this C project piece. Really, yeah. You have the PAYGO, the C projects. Can yeah. I just make one observation on that? To your point, Tony, is that we struggled to get, and, and I would say that the two organizations that I was involved in this on did not have the cutting edge uh, technology systems, and we really struggled to get the headspace from a resource and dollar standpoint to work on the future because all of our resources were spent on legacy system patchwork, keeping the lights on. And so we kind of made the bold step of, you know what, we're freezing all changes to legacy systems, and I bet the world will go on. Yeah. And it did. Yeah. You know, they were impassioned pleas about why you can do that, you're going to bring both into its knees. We froze it, and we took all the resources and put them towards the future. And guess what? So I, I mean, that was, that, you know, that was an important step for us, was just say, I heard all the arguments about how we can. Oh, sorry. Please. Oh, I, I couldn't resist jumping in please, for one second. Please. The chart on page eight that Shantanu showed is really powerful. I lived through this once before in my former life. I, my current life is just like yours. Manual time sheets, legacy systems that Clara Bart coded on. I mean, it's kind of amazing. <laughs> but in, <laughs> once upon a time, I did live in a world where we, we did this, and it gives perfect clarity because it forces your business leaders to work with IT because there, there are two parts of this equation, the revenue and expense or the savings and expense. And then you create a spreadsheet and just prioritize it by net present value and draw a line when your budget is over. And everything below that line, you can just put big X through. So, um, this is a really powerful tool to get prioritization and clarity. Okay, um, we're, let me do this. I'm gonna do, let's get the second topic out, and then let's get quick reaction to the second topic. I think this first topic is clearly rich, and we're gonna keep driving on it to really get the lessons. Uh, yeah, I think I think one of the things we need to do. If there's a clear message that deputy secretaries and many everyone at this table already is, and many across government are spending more time here than they ever have before. We also have to figure out, as Tony, you captured it, or, or Dan, or both of you, which is how do we make sure that it lives beyond exactly. just your tenure? Um, so that, that's a dual challenge. Uh, so I, I think it's clear that this topic is worthy of a lot more exploration across the summer. Let's get the second topic on the table. Quick right, yeah. sure. Really quickly, this is um, a critical topic. Uh, on page 11. Government, on page 11, which is, how we actually look at IT vendor performance management. The, the United States government is the largest buyer of information technology. We spend $80 billion every year. Uh, and we spent $600 billion over the last uh, decade. And the majority of that money is actually spent on vendors. It, it's not uh, money that's spent on uh, government employees, but it's outsourced systems or hiring consultants to come in and build solutions government. 
Uh, the challenge within the government is that uh, the way we track performance is actually done by project managers, which creates disincentives because they want to see the project move forward. And billing and compliance is actually managed by another group within the federal government, which is the contracting officers. And uh, as we look at the separation of payment and performance, it creates a huge divide uh, on how these uh, contracts are uh, managed effectively. We also, unfortunately, from an IT services perspective, have a very complex environment in terms of how we monitor uh, and require very specific expertise that are lacking within the federal government in terms of the workforce itself. So the private sector obviously does it very differently. It starts with the fact that up front, there's very heavy engagement with business partners, where in government, it's the opposite, where the government doesn't really engage uh, with the, uh, potential vendors up front. Secondly, there's a very uh, rigorous process, and a lot of time is actually devoted up front to statements of work uh, that are developed, and the performance goals are actually set, set up front rather than afterwards. And uh, lastly, in terms of uh, reviewing vendor performance, it's a very healthy ecosystem of private sector that we've seen. And Ricky is gonna walk us through uh, some of the great work that's actually happening within his company. Thanks for that. So you heard Shantanu say about having accountability from the business. This is really about how you have accountability on the vendor side. Mm -hmm. that, that's the real question. You spend $80 million, how do you have accountability on the vendor side? And so what, what we looked at was, through this process, this doesn't replace the project management that Vivek talked about, which is really about project execution, and it doesn't replace the role of procurement around negotiating the actual contract. This is actually the move between those two groups that says, how do we drive the accountability? What we found was that throughout the process, there was always a lot of leakage. Starting with spend management, we heard Danny talk about going back to the segment leader and figuring out what is specifically already being done and how do we get some leverage? Well, the idea is you have to formalize the opportunity to do that. The second thing is, when you look at different categories, project managers are not experts in those categories. They're trying to solve a specific problem. As you try to go do that, you end up with a lot of vendor fragmentation. So what you need is somebody who's saying, if we do networking, if we do storage, if we do applications, who are the vendors of choice? And you're really trying to get down to a smaller set of people that you work with. Uh, next point is as you inform the contract and negotiation, you want some level of consistency. You don't want each new contract to start over with what are going to be the expectations for the point. Then you go through the procurement cycle and then you consolidate the whole payment process. If you look at our company, we spend about $724 million a year, 700 different vendors, but we have 25 that we would consider strategic that really fit into the heavy management of what we call the vendor management office. So let's take a look at the solution if you go to slide 13. The challenge has been clearly articulated by the back in the, in the notion that they, we have inconsistent vendor performance. And so the question is, how do you improve vendor performance across the board and get efficiency out of that $80 billion? What we did is we decided to have a small central group. We're talking six people that are really looking after the 25 strategic vendors and driving a centralized review process that is not impeding or inhibiting the work done by the project managers, but it's making sure that the value is being realized and the vendors are delivered. The second point is what we want to make sure is that there is a linkage between the business goal and what the vendor ultimately delivers. And so you need somebody who is paying attention to that throughout the process that has some level of objectivity. It isn't in the sprints, because inside of the marathon, there are these little bursts that you have to go through. And when they get heads head, head down, they lose the visibility to, is the vendor really performing? The other thing that you want to do though, when you build this group is you want to make sure they have some subject matter expertise. You look at our company. We work with AT&T and Verizon. The person in the VMO who looks after telecom, they came from that industry. They understand the industry. They understand the inner workings of telecom. And so then they can go back and say, you know what, I know how the system works. You're not delivering on what you said. So it's important to have the folks in this area really be true experts with the folks that they're going to interact with. What we see, clear benefits. 
consistent tracking of financial performance to the objectives that were originally set out. Two, you get the local IT project managers that are freed up to run the project and are not as focused on the vendor side. Their goal is to meet the business result, the project manager's goal is to meet the business result and allow the BMO to make sure that the vendor is performing. Now, the other thing that we see is that it clearly allows us to bring the organization together that's not procurement and that's not the project management team. And then lastly for us, which is very important, uh, as a security company, we had a lot of people who would buy and procure services and they weren't thinking about the risk management aspect. We buy, and the example we give listed here is they go out and they buy a hosting service. But that hosting service has been appropriately vetted. And now it created a potential security liability for the company. And so what we've done is by working with the DMO and we're going to go procure a service, we also have some risk management that's being done there to make sure that they're meeting some of the things that we feel are very important. In this case, for example, that our systems are not too compromised. Small group of people that are really focused on holding the vendors accountable for what they said they're going to do in the initial contracting process, separate from the actual day-to-day -day execution of the project. Let, let, let's get some reaction. I guess this would be primarily from your CIO yeah. as to how different this is from what we do and, and most importantly, how applicable are these kinds of best practices. Tony, you want to talk about the interior reactions? Um, overwhelmingly positive in terms of uh, what we look at is, is, is if we look at IT, the way we are is we don't really have a classic uh, value chain of the order model where all of the supporting business processes are tightly integrated with one another to produce whatever our social ROI is. So it's an extensive communications of will my procurement folks do this, will my HR folks do this, will my labor relations folks do this, or our solicitors folks do that. So we create the relationships there. What you're sounds like what you're talking about is, is a hybridization of skills that are necessary to oversee almost, you didn't use the word architecture, which is in some quarters very refreshing, but it's a hybridization of skills that are looked at as to what it means in terms of the business needs. So you bring up the thing of like someone from the telecom sector, is that a business analyst or is that a box picker that you brought in to, to look at that, that? We have the, uh, some issues where we have people that were enamored with the technology and they haven't looked at the business purposes of what that technology is for. And it's, we, we work constantly on no solutions and look at what the needs are first. Um, hey, sorry, I messed up. Becky, I didn't see you. I, um, please enter the conversation as, as the deputy of Congress. Well, I, actually, I'd, I'd love to say something on this topic in particular, which please. I think is really um, uh, relevant to, in many ways, um, I find a little bit more, you know, the first conversation is fascinating, but you know, I, I feel like in a, a very distributed department, I have much more limited ability to move resources and drive priorities across the entire department. You know, I, I can't move resources away from weather satellites into the census department. I just don't have that spending flexibility. Whereas I can enforce constant business practices across all of those bureaus. And um, this is an area where particularly the, the current budget situation we're in, I think has been incredibly useful to us to give us in some sense a, a, you know, a clarity of call. Um, you know, this is something we can go out and say, given the budget environment we're in, we have to change our business practices around vending, of which IT is a very, very important piece. It's such a large piece of our spend. So um, the question of how we deal effectively and you know, more effectively and more consistently with IT choices across the, um, you know, so, so, so that you know, it, it saves you money, um, it lets you provide better expertise from your central acquisition of the department in terms of how it interacts with all the other groups. I mean, the, the, this issue in particular um, is something that our department is in the midst of and one that um, I think we can make real progress on. And I just, I find these comments terribly helpful in that sense. Yeah, it's really important. I think one point that Enrique made was really important, which is who's managing the vendor? If it's the relationship manager, managing the vendor over time, it's very hard for them to be uh, not biased or you know feel like their own performance is going to be right. measured relative to the vendor's performance. And so I, I think that's a really important point to think about. Question for us, I mean, which struck me up, 
Is there an opportunity for us to set up a government block, you know, right, through GSA? Because boy, if you said, boy, I'm going to have real expertise in managing overall telecom spend, right, across all the agencies. If you look at that budget, that that kind of power and expertise and understanding various practices and contracting mechanisms and performance be hugely valuable. So, so do it by areas of spend. Yeah, when you're back to the same, when you really get domain expertise, you concentrate it, and then. As an agency, we, we welcome that, right? Think about, think about your ROI and buying those services from GSA. I mean, I assume we would be yeah. extraordinary returns assuming GSA can set up that kind of expertise. Jeff, just maybe one more. You realize how big a hammer an $80 billion IP right. spend <laughs> hammer <laughs> is? <laughs> yeah, and it, $80 billion. Dollars. And it would imply that you have a first-rate IT system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first thought. Spending that five wires. Yeah, we're the low over two. We spend a lot of money. Yeah, I think what happens is what happens is what really happens is you get leakage throughout the whole process. And so by having a little higher level of control and accountability to the vendors, you actually will limit some of that leakage. I mean, you, you spend a lot of money that we lose throughout the process. And I, I agree, you have so much efficiency. I, I mean, we we have targets that the VMO drives, quite frankly, across the vendor community, because they're responsible for that vendor relationship with yeah. yeah. What's the right scale set? Tony, I think it's fascinating. Is that possible? Is that possible? Oh, yeah. yeah, it is, I, I believe. Yeah. Because, I mean, think about, I mean, GSA is there with right. a set of services. Agencies can purchase those services. If they have the kind of return, which I would imagine they could have pretty easily, right. especially given the state of affairs today, do you like that being at GSA, or do you like, is that is that um, trying to create something that's too big or too, or would you rather build those capabilities at the individual? Last agencies? time we were here, I understood that there had been a decision made in the last several years to decentralize procurement. We had that conversation. Well, there's and a decentralization I, of, of, of a lot of procurement at GSA, but it is, it, it's a, and, and Scott and others who you know, the train better jump in, it's sort of a, it, it's a voluntary basis, it's a market basis. So it's not a command and control. Well, that seems to be a policy decision that should be made yeah. involuntarily. <laughs> can I throw out, I, I mean, my, my instinct is it's not a good idea to do it at GSA, mm -hmm. frankly. I mean, our organizations are all very, very large. And if, and, and we are trying to control them, if, if we have to go outside to yet another you know, organization to get expertise that we can apply. It just feels That's like, yeah. Plus, you know, I, I, uh, I the thing that uh, that, that, that really uh, strikes me here, Ricky, is the risk management piece. I mean, this is what we're finding. Where it's it's bad enough when you're spending a lot of money, you're not getting a good result. But when you're actually increasing your risk, and 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 you're you're finding you're in the middle of a of a, of a software deal where you can't even use the data because you don't have the rights to it and that kind of thing. I mean, that that's the kind of thing that the, the, the close day-to-day -day manager may not, because, you know, so, so I, and, and I, I query whether you can outsource that to GSA, you know, I, I yeah. So. I think it's a kind of, just a quick reaction on the telecom mission. What you may want to think about, though, is what services are more, for lack of a better term, Commodity. Yes, that's exactly. Yeah, 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 y
uh, and, and actually picking up on Liz's point earlier, if you do that on a market voluntary basis, then you are dependent on who decides to participate or not. If on the other hand, you identify what those uh, vendors are and those services are, then you just lay down the law and says those are gonna be done centrally, yep. period, and these are not, uh, you have some chance of uh, achieving something in that group that Tony's uh, postulated. So but I, if you leave it to the market, I don't think you have a chance of success to Liz's point earlier. I think the VMO concept is, is a no-brainer. We have to figure out the work across the summer to figure out how we institutionalize it and make it work and what's centralized, what's commodity, what's at the agency, uh, but how do we stand this up? But one thing that also has to happen is who gets the benefit of using the shared service. So if the department goes to the shared service, and let's say that it was going to cost them X amount, and now by going through the centralized process, it's less. The department needs to realize that and say, you know, they, have they to, will. As long as they do, they there's will. an incentive to do it. Right. Yeah. There's an incentive to do it, because otherwise. Yeah, no, they, they, that's, how, that's how it works. Sure. Or concept. You gotta make sure that. And state governments, even though a much smaller scale, have already pretty much moved to shared services. We, we have to look that. I think we um, stand with one system. Well, I just, just one other observation about a VMO. It seems to me important. This links back to, to Shane's comments about architectural efficiency. It would seem to me that most vendors that you work with want to build their own new platform. Um, you know, they, they, they have no interest in building on somebody else's or building the system with, with what somebody else has done. It seems important to me that there's, a, there's some form of government governance, um, probably the CIO level, that works in conjunction with the VMO to make sure that as you buy, as you procure, that it's done consistently and, and consistent with whatever your vision is, the CIO's vision for architecture within the agency. If you don't do that, everybody's, everybody's going to build it. But they have no, they have no motivation for a vendor, um, and even little motivation for those that are, that are working closely with the vendor to, uh, to build consistent with the architectural vision. So, so I think it's been a very rich conversation. I think it's confirmation that this group's on the two good topics. And there's plenty of work to drive them home across the summer so that we have actionable items for November. Um, it's 10 after. We're close to being on schedule. Let's take a 10 minute break, a real 10 minute break. So at 10 20, we're going to switch to the SES topic. There are restrooms outside. Thank you, everybody.